welcome to our service. Let's pray together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Reminding ourselves of the summary of the law, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we've received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Praying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we have ought to have done, and we've done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and sincerely believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and then at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God.
there can be a bit of a crash. In fact, it's pretty ordinary that after experiencing a high and celebratory occasion to feel down and a bit blue. And the fact of the matter is, as you know, life is not always lived on the top of a mountain. We have days where feelings of joy and happiness are palpable, but so too are the days where things seem unchanging and monotonous with the occasional bad day at the office. And that's okay, we're human beings. I find it incredibly helpful that the Psalms in our Bible, the prayer book that Jesus himself was nurtured and shaped by, is filled with prayers whereby we come to God with fully open hearts, prayerfully sharing praises, celebrations, thanksgiving, as well as the laments and the heartbreaks, all the while acknowledging the consistent, loving faithfulness of God, even when it's difficult to trust Him. His faithfulness doesn't vary. His faithfulness doesn't grow weary. And unlike us, he's not very moody. So be encouraged, friends. If you have times, whether you wonder whether the circumstances of your life and effect of faith affect God holding you in Christ, it doesn't. Our ancestors of faith, including Jesus, didn't live outside the realities of human life. Yet they were honest about it in their worship, in their devotion, and in their processions to the temple. And perhaps more importantly, the circumstances of our life doesn't change what God is doing and what he calls his people to be at the church. Let me say that again. That the circumstances of our life, the ebb and flow, doesn't change what God is doing and what he has call, called us to be as his people, the church. And the early church understood this challenge of living a centered life in Jesus. In the midst of life's ebb and flow. They lived out the mission Jesus commissioned them with. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded. But the early Christian communities understood that a call to living a Christ-centered life as they attended to their growth and maturity, maturity in Jesus and pursued effective evangelism required an understanding that it wasn't based on how they felt on a given day. You know what I'm talking about? Like some days you don't want to be near me, right? I'm sure it's the same. I'm guessing. Maybe not. But the church, having said that, they also knew that they were to pursue effective evangelism. They were to lead others to Jesus and live towards biblical justice in their communities so that widows and orphans and destitute persons would, as James reminds us, be recipients of the grace in Christ's body, the church. And today's gospel, John 21, 1 to 14, has been a go-to passage in which the early church read it both as a historical event that took place, but also at a deep, parable-like level, a profound metaphor of truth. And early Christians also understood that this fishing account was key to staying focused and being effective in their apostolic mission. So let's set up the scene really quickly. John 21, we'll pick up right at verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed him himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself this way. New paragraph. Simon Peter said to them, the other disciples he was with, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, well, we'll go with you. 
Well, at first glance, it seems astonishing that Peter decides and the others follow to head out and going fishing. It's fascinating that Peter decides to go fishing given what has just happened near the previous chapter of chapter 20. So as a reminder, we had the unexpected surprise and wonder on the morning of the resurrection too. And then Jesus made his first appearance to a larger gathering of the disciples. You may remember that when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace with you. Thomas wasn't there. So then Jesus makes his second appearance, which I believe was right in the gospel last week. A week later, his disciples were again in the house. Thomas was with them, and all the doors were shut. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it on my side. Don't doubt, but believe. And then Thomas declares the greatest absurdity as a, as a Jewish person, person, my Lord, my Master, and my God. That this mysterious economy of Jesus' character is, is called God. And so then, picking right up there at verse 21, Peter says, keeping in mind all that's just witnessed, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, hey, we'll go with you. Grab the lunch. Get the cooler. So why the heck are they going fishing? Well, there have been many things written about Peter's apparent blunder here. Perhaps given his history of fickleness, he had another swing of faith. Maybe he now denied the resurrection never happened. And so he went back to his regular job. What he been doing for a living before Jesus called him to become a fisher of people and not just uh, fishers of fish. But, but if we trace through the Gospels a little bit, particularly in Matthew and Mark, we see that there's an angel in Matthew 28, 7, Mark 16, 7. There's an angel, a messenger of God, who told the disciples... Return to Galilee. Go back to Galilee. There you will see Jesus. So we want to appreciate that the disciples, Peter and his buddies, they're exactly where they should be. At the Sea of Galilee, known also as the Sea of Tiberias. So it's nighttime, the time fishers would normally head out, and they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Nothing, which is, you know, it's not very much. And just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered, no. And he said, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Well, if you fish, and particularly if you're a pro, the last thing you want to hear is that it's on vice, advice on where you should be fishing at. Peter and his cronies had methods and strategies they'd used for years, even before they met Jesus, who had called them to become fishers for men and women. But it's not working. They're not catching anything. So they did what this guy on the shore said. They cast it on the other side, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, and the author of John often says, calls that out himself. He said to Peter, hey, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that, that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for his naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they're not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. So I mentioned at the outset, the early church read this as an actual historical account, and they differentiated it from other accounts when Jesus was in the boat with them, giving instructions on how to fish. But at deep, parable-like level, 
the early church understood this fishing account to hold the key in staying focused in its apostolic mission and in being effective in living out what Jesus had commissioned them to. In other words, friends, Jesus shows us if we want to be effective in following Jesus, if we want to be effective in living out the mission of the church Christ has called us, if we want to be the church whose members are growing and maturing, look what's going on in the boat. No fish. Jesus says, put it the right side. And they cast it, and now they were not able to heal it, haul it in because there were so many fish. Now what we miss here is this simple act of obedience. Utter dependency on God. I wonder, well, this isn't, it, it just doesn't seem like a rational thing to do. But there is a simple act of obedient faith stepping into it and an utter dependency on God. Oswald Chambers has had an interesting comment on this. He said, Have Jesus ever commanded us to do something that he was unable to equip us to, equip us to accomplish? He would be a liar. And if we make our own inability a stumbling block or an excuse not to be obedient, it means we're telling God there's something which he has not yet taken into account. Every element of our own self-reliance must be put to death by the power of God. The moment we recognize our complete weakness and our dependence upon him will be the very moment that the Spirit of God will exhibit his power. Simple act of obedience. Some would say reckless, trusting faith, utter dependency on God. See, friends, when we work under the direction of Jesus, he isn't passive. He's not desperately in need of our hard work and efforts. Like in the account of the fishes and loaves, which were multiplied for a large picnic for thousands, in the end, it was his provision. And we are indeed the body of Jesus. The church is. We're empowered with the wild presence of the Holy Spirit. But it's Christ's church. And ultimately, it's his work that he does through us as we in faith step out in obedience. That isn't to say we're not supposed to participate. We are indeed called to be diligent in our work for the kingdom of God, and to plan accordingly. We have a sense of urgency that everyone in our neighborhoods would have opportunity to know Jesus as the great rescuer, our Savior. We are called to strive for biblical justice in our communities and institutions, and that widows and orphans and destitute persons would, as James reminds us, be recipients of the grace found through Christ's body, the church. But it's God's work, ultimately. It doesn't matter how we feel on a given day. Show up. Jesus is the sovereign and risen Lord. It's because this is true. We're invited to prayerfully be prepared for surprise. For surprise. Be surprised by his timing and his means of bringing change in his way. Now, the context for us to understand this is that these fishers have already been commissioned as fishers of people, right? We see that much earlier in the Gospels. And so we come to appreciate, and the early church did this so much, that the catch of so many fish symbolizes the evangelization and the salvation of so many people. The fish and the abundance symbolizes the evangelization and the salvation of so many people. But again, notice the results didn't hinge or depend ultimately 
on our technical tools or ideas, but the act of trusting and obeying the sovereign one. Let me just give you an example how we might see this. I've often thought how the church in the West has access to some of the most advanced and sophisticated tools for evangelism in the world. And while clearly some of them have been effective and brought the hope of Jesus to many people, the West, yes, including Canada, has now become one of the greatest mission fields on the planet. And yet it's equally interesting that the church in parts of the southern majority world where technical and financial resources are not necessarily as accessible, we see greater numbers of people evangelized and discipled. Utterly, absolutely dependent on God. The church prayerfully brought their efforts of evangelism and church members participating, knowing this is a cooperative work with God, all the while understanding they could do nothing apart from Jesus, told others about Christ, lived like citizens for the kingdom. Now, I just want to pause for a moment. To appreciate that in John's gospel, a faithful obedience to Jesus is informed by his central teaching back in chapter 15. In John 15, verse 5 and 7, now please listen to this and think about where you live. I'm not just talking conceptually, theoretically in your head. Jesus says, guys, I'm the vine. Those who abide in me and I them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can't do a thing. But if you abide in me and my words, his teaching, his commandments, those abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Russell Moore has written that for too long we've called people to invite Jesus into their life. Well, Jesus doesn't want to be in our life. He calls us into his life. This is just a remarkable difference. So abiding in Jesus is the training and practicing what is true. You belong to Jesus. Your identity is found in Jesus. Your life is upheld by Jesus. And the more that we are with him, the more we resemble him. Maybe you've heard that couples married after many years begin to resemble other, the, other, the other, which may not be good news for some of you. <laughs> but we want to resemble Jesus, or perhaps I should say he wants us to resemble him. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because of a part from you, you can do nothing. Abiding, remaining, living alongside, walking, talking with Jesus, being present, listening to him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, it'll be done. Walking, talking with Jesus in prayer, being present and listening to him, obeying his word, abiding, remaining. Faithful obedience to Christ is followed and shaped by the lifelong practice of abiding and remaining in Jesus. Now I'm going to pull that side panel down and we go back to the boat. Jesus is telling us if we want to be effective in living out the church's mission and be the church whose members are growing and maturing, look at what happens in the boat. As they prayerfully abide in Jesus, they obeyed and trusted him, knowing they can do nothing apart from him. His directions, his call, his commands are the best and the most truthful ones that bring freedom for our life. Okay, so we move from the overwhelming catch of fish, Peter jumped into the water after John points out the person of, uh, on the shore that is Jesus. We go from obedience to following Jesus' direction to fish elsewhere. And now us being with Jesus 
in join a shore breakfast where Jesus invites the contribution of our fish, fishing efforts, where he wants to love us and care for us and feed us and know that he is our shepherd. Jesus said in verse 12, Come, let's have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. But Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and did the same with the fish. One writer has put it this way, that the holy breath is not independent of the master who breathes it out of the sovereign God, of the Creator. Neither the institutional church nor its individual members can upstage him. Jesus welcomes Peter's catch of fish. He asks them to bring some of it, but he doesn't, in that sense, need it. And so on the shore, Jesus provides rest, a meal, And he serves them bread and fish in a manner resembling his actions at the Lord's Supper. He provides care for them. He provides care for us. See, Jesus is our home. He is, by the Spirit, the only one through whom we can be effective in mission. Jesus is our shepherd who guides and nurtures us, sending us then into the world to obediently trust in doing what he says, despite our feelings, to be effective in the mission he has called us to. Quoting Chambers again, the highest Christian love is not devotion to work or to a cause, but to Jesus. So friends, while John's gospel is at one level simple telling the story, of the risen Jesus and his disciples on the beach having breakfast together. There's a great and profound underlying theme here. And that is that we are called into kingdom life when we live for Jesus, when we surrender to him, when we follow him and work for and serve God's kingdom, knowing that he is the one ultimately doing the heavy lifting. We just get to cooperate, and he loves it. And we are called to prayerfully listen and act in obedience. In your life of faith, are there areas where you sense things aren't happening at the pace or the manner which you prefer? God may be telling you to do something, but you prefer not to. In fact, you'll choose another way, another method, another technique. He may be asking you to patiently wait and to show up, and to trust and obey, even if it's difficult, even if it's painful. And it may be that you're involved in some ministry, and you're frustrated and tired of what feels like things are going nowhere. You've been convinced that the ebb and flow of life and the moodiness of your soul defines what is really happening in the kingdom of God. So here it is. We sit be present, and eat with Jesus who serves us. We let him feed and care for us. And then simply, yep, simply, live life prayerfully abiding in Jesus, trusting what he tells you rather than what you may feel on a given day. As the old and somewhat corny song goes, trust and obey because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Let's continue by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And please join me in praying a prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week.